Um, so what I'm going to do right now is um, I'm going to leave my computer and walk into my, uh, my personal space. What you see right now is the Newburgh Community Photo Project part of my studio here at Atlas. Okay, so if you were this is my workspace, which is just behind the Newburgh Community Photo Project. And you see some images from the Gays in the Military Project hanging on the wall and flat files, which contain um, a lot of photographs. But I also have an archive room back in my house because from 40 years of photographing um, and still using film, not digital, um, I continue to um, amass lots of paper, <laughs> I should say. Uh, what I have laid out here uh, are the two publications that were mentioned in the introduction, We Skate Hard War and Gays in the Military. Um, these are both very long-term projects and they both uh, began to employ something other than traditional documentary methods and that is uh, collaborating with subjects, engaging them in the project themselves, as well as utilizing them in venues outside of the tr traditional gallery or museum uh, exhibition spaces. Uh, so I work a lot with communities. I engage with communities uh, when I do projects. My projects last anywhere from three years to, uh, to nine years, which was the We Skate Hardcore project. And the photographs I... Um, Throughout my career, I actually have um, pursued conversations with institutions such as libraries, such as the Library of Congress, or other institutional uh, venues, such as museums um, or other archives to collect my work. Uh, I took a studio in Atlas about six years ago. And right now I'm gonna show you some pictures um, of a project that I started working on. Is that coming through okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so when I took the studio at uh, Atlas, I began photographing along Liberty Street, which is where uh, Atlas is situated. And I started to realize at the time that Liberty Street runs uh, the entire length of Newburgh uh, as much as it could from north to south. And the neighborhoods that went along this route uh, were very, very different. Um, so one of the photographs that I made was this, which is on the side of Safe Harbors. It says, my dream is too big and other things. Uh, start photographing people on the street, um, documenting the people who live in this community and along Liberty Street, uh, which sometimes uh, gives us a sense that the word liberty does not really pertain to some of the people's lives that live along here. Mm. Initially, my studio was in the basement of Atlas and I had been photographing, I think for three years. Um, when in 2016, uh, we had an, an election, a presidential election, which, as we know, has changed the course of our history. And I started to think about what I could do uh, in response to what might occur over the next four years. My undergraduate degree is from Penn State University, and it's in uh, community development or community organizing and radical social politics. And I was a community organizer for uh, a few years, even while I was going to school. And a lot of this, uh, a lot of this uh, social um, and political uh, interest of mine, which began at a very young age, started to merge into the work that I was doing. So I began doing documentary work in 1983 uh, when I started to do graduate work at SUNY New Pulse. So I'm going to switch from this. I'm going to turn you around a little bit. There we go. And there is a door here that actually leads into a space that I spend a lot of time in. And that is a dark room. 
So it's a traditional black and white dark room, which many people are not familiar with, but I'm sure most of us here know what a dark room is like. So that was the wet side. This is the dry side of the dark room. The interesting thing about this dark room is that during the quarantine, I spent countless hours in here, probably eight to 10 hours a day for five, six days a week. And what I did was I began uh, looking over negatives that I had shot of the New York City Gay Pride March between the years 1985 and 1995. So with that, I am going to walk into the front space and I will show you some images and talk a little bit about that experience and also the project itself. And what I will do is I'm going to switch back over. So I'm going to leave here and Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. All right. So when I was working in the dark room, of course, we know that a lot of major events uh, took place during that time, which, which are affecting our lives uh, very seriously right now. Um, as I mentioned, I, I began working on this, uh, this group of negatives, probably over two or 300 uh, uh, rolls of film that I shot during those 10 years. Never really had a chance to, um, to print them because of a lot of other projects or uh, even work-related things that were going on. I've been teaching for 35 or 40 years, so a large part of my career has been um, teaching young people, um, not only photography, but also activism, because most of the classes that I teach are geared towards documentary, uh, identity politics, uh, and other social and political issues. As a result of printing the dark room for four and a half months, I came up with um, an edition of three um, of 80 to 100 photographs. I still have maybe about 20 to print. Um, and each of these three editions will be going into uh, institution, institutional collections, such as the Museum of the City of New York, and also the Archive and Documentary Arts at Duke University. Um, but one of the things that really struck me when I was working on this is how relevant these pictures that I was printing from 30, 35 years ago are still today. Um, one image that I came across that I never knew I had, and I'm not sure if, any, if everyone is uh, familiar with uh, uh, the gay rights movement, uh, the Stonewall uh, incident in 1969, but the two people who actually started the gay rights movement were um, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. I never knew I had this negative, and when I saw it, I was really kind of overwhelmed with it, uh, just finding this and being able to print it, you know, 35 years later. Um, during this time, 1985 to 1995, we were in the midst of the AIDS epidemic, uh, again, another correlation to what we've been experiencing with COVID uh, in terms of the, um, the stigma that's attached to it, uh, the, the politics around it, uh, the access to medical care, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the gay pride marches during those 10 years were really about activism um, and actually uh, mobilizing for more political power uh, to bring more medical care and access uh, to the LGBTQ community. So during these marches, many times they would have moments of silence for people who died. Um, and they would have people from organizations such as the Gay Men's Health Crisis uh, marching as well uh, to actually demonstrate or, um, or march for rights, uh, for not only medical rights or medical access, I should say, but also for housing um, and other um, daily living uh, conditions. Uh, this photograph, I actually, um, I actually really struck me because 
I printed it probably a day after George Floyd happened. And I realized that a lot of the communities that we are fighting for now to have uh, more equality and better access and better representation in our society um, are still those same communities that were fighting for that very same thing 40 years ago. Uh, so it really kind of you know, struck me very powerfully that many things have not changed. Uh, even though there's been great progress, fundamentally we have been taken back 40 years or maybe even longer. Um, but also we have not gone far enough um, really to, uh, to attain what, where we really should be. I'll just show you a few more of these pictures. Do you have a plan for these? For these? Um... Um, well, as I had mentioned, there, uh, I did three editions. Um, the three of them will be going into three very specific institutions, one of which would be the Museum of the City of New York, which has a major, major collection of some other bodies of work, including We Skate Hardcore. So when I do, uh, probably this fall or early spring, uh, I'll be sitting down talking with the curator at the Museum of the City of New York, uh, and talking about the acquisition of the portfolio, which will end up being about 100 images. Uh, at that time, we'll probably discuss the option of having an exhibition there, again, and or a book. Um, so hopefully those things will be worked out within the next year or so. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones, Lesbians for Patsy Cline. Of course, there's always humor um, in with these. Uh, there's always, um, you know, issues and ideas about family. This is actually a friend of mine and her son who is gay and her other son who is straight. Um, so it, whenever I do these projects, there's, there's very intimate, very personal connection uh, to the projects that I do. And they usually stem from my own experience. So for example, We Skate Hardcore was a nine year project in the south side of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where I lived for 15 years. So during those 15 years, I became involved in the community, uh, doing uh, volunteer work at this uh, drug crisis intervention center, teaching photography to uh, ex-cons and also recovering drug addicts. Um, the gays in the military grew out of my own identity as a gay man, um, but also my identity of uh, never tapping into the military. Growing up during the 70s, demonstrating against the Vietnam War, my relationship with, with the military was very different than a lot of LGBTQ people who joined the military. And I was curious as to why they wanted to join an organization such as the military. Um, oh, excuse me, when, uh, when that organization essentially did not want them um, and banned them from really being open in the military. Um, what you see now is as I developed my work, as I, as I said before, it became more and more socially engaged, more and more engaged with the community and also involving collaborative work uh, with members of the community. 2016, I mentioned that I, 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 uh, I wanted to, um, I started to develop the idea of um, a grassroots community-based photo program to teach youth 16 to 24 here in Newburgh, uh, photography and also engagement or activism within their community. So I started the Newburgh Community Photo Project. I took this space in uh, January of 2017 uh, it was an L-shaped studio. I broke it up into, uh, behind the, the, the computer here um, is, a, is a wall that has an archive in it. You saw my dark room and my office space. So this front room, which faces out to the street, you can see the windows a little bit on your, uh, your right-hand side. Um, this space is out to the street. This was a perfect uh, space uh, to actually conduct these workshops. The first year that I ran the workshops, which was in 2000, summer of 2017, uh, I basically just leafleted the neighborhood and got eight people who were interested in learning of photography, learning uh, a more um, documentary and photojournalism uh, bent to making photographs 
And what we did for that first summer, we worked on a shoestring budget. Uh, and basically, they were a little bit older than what my intentional uh, target audience was, or intended uh, target audience was. They were a little bit older. So what we did was we worked on a collaborative um, project of, um, on gun violence uh, here in the city of Newburgh. And it really kind of established the Newburgh Community Photo Project um, as an integral space for people's voices to be heard for those communities who would not normally enter a space like this, and also those communities who don't normally have access uh, to the arts. Um, so there was, uh, we got a couple of grants for the following year and we started a very concentrated program uh, intended for uh, kids or young adults from 16 to 24 years old through an application and interview process. Uh, they take workshops, which actually teaches them the basics of photography, uh, concepts of lighting, uh, equipment, different lenses, uh, but also the concept of the photo essay, uh, writing captions, uh, writing essays, uh, you know, uh, word essays along with the, the pictures, uh, as well as interview techniques, interviewing techniques. Um, they also receive a stipend of $500 each. Um, and we have an exhibition usually in this space, but we also have a public presence by doing some kind of public art. The first year they were banners uh, that were hanging up around the corner on Liberty Street. Last year we did these public service announcements around integration, domestic violence, and teen suicide, uh, to name just a couple, and also food sustainability. Um, I mentioned that I was working in my dark room during the spring, during the, the lockdown, and I started to think ab about the fact that we would not be able to deli deliver the kinds of workshops that we normally do. So I had to think or rethink of what we might be able to do. So it, I had been working on a collaborative project with JR the artist and the school that he teaches at in uh, the outskirts of Paris. Uh, with my students at Parsons. And as an outgrowth of that collaboration, I thought that this would be a great opportunity for young people here to work on a collaborative project in conjunction with JR's Inside Out project, which is a global public art action um, institution that provides uh, support and also printing services to organizations that want to do their own public art actions. Essentially what, what I did was I, I actually contacted five of the students from the previous uh, two workshops and we actually worked on this collaborative art project, photographing people with masks that say COVID safe, I can't breathe and hashtag BLM. And uh, we actually pasted um, these posters on approximately 10 buildings in the city of Newburgh one of which is the City Club, which is right next to the library. And recently there was a Harriet Tubman statue that was installed there. Um, so that relationship between uh, the images that are on the City Club building, which are mostly city officials and community leaders with the statue has a really wonderful dialogue that takes place.